everybody out in God's house this morning. This past few weeks, we've been going through a series of uh, topic is transformation, changing our city and our world by changing our hearts and our lives. Now, the pastor touched on a few uh, other topics weeks gone by. He, he spoke about salvation, a new heart. Then he talks about sanctification, a changing heart. And a week ago, he spoke about dedication, a surrendered heart. Today, I want to talk to you about construction, an open heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. They are yea and amen. We might not understand everything in your word, Lord, but you want us to. You want us to apply ourselves. You want us to, to have open ears and open hearts to what you want to say to us. I need you today. Your people need you today. So we come as needy people with raised hands and open hearts, open minds. Give us open ears to hear what you have to say to us today in your word, through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a lengthy passage. I didn't realize how lengthy it was until I see the 9 o'clock people dozing on me. I had to threaten somebody. I said, man, if you doze again, I'm, I'm going to throw something at you. you know, I, so if you can't handle a 9 o'clock service, I said to him, come to the 11. You know, those are the, those are the people that are awake. So I had to um, wake up somebody on that one. But I have a big topic ahead of me because consistently Barner research is regularly and consistent, consistently showing that Christian life and lifestyles are not much different than the non-Christian life and lifestyles. That bothers me. Few election, uh, in the beginning of the election, there was a slogan, change that you can believe in. Uh, let me tell you something. The only change that you and I can believe in is the change that Jesus Christ brings about in those who trust him. And that's what he wants to do. He knows, and God knows that in order for this world to change, we have to change. The, the salt and the light, the people that he left here on purpose, have to change. Understand something. God could have had a salvation plan where he saved you, and then he have. He have a beam you up program where he just suck you right out of this earth. He could have had that program, but he chose not to. He chose to leave us here, human. We struggling with our own personal weaknesses and battles in our own souls and hearts and lives and minds. And he says, I'm going to use you in spite of you. That's humbling. Because you know what? I can't do it. When last you look in the mirror and says, I can't do it. You need, and I need, God's power to work in us and through us if change is going to happen. But it takes two for that to happen. We'll talk more about that. I try to, I try to break it down a little bit so we can understand. So my topic is God's construction project, an open heart. As you know, I'm in construction, and I, I'm, I'm holding back to tell you the project that I recently started at my house. Now, some of you are chuckling because I almost had a nervous breakdown. I just started painting. And it's sad when you start painting and your plumbing is leaking. Hello, Serge. <laughs> He's a plumber, so I can say that. It's bad when you're painting and, the, and then you see the ceiling is getting wet when you're putting the primer on. Can I tell you something? A little secret. I hate plumbing. <laughs> I want you to know that this project started out really in my mind. Now, you can call my mind small, but it was small, the project. And I, 
but you, you know projects. If you've done anything around your house, projects, they, in your mind, this is a piece of cake. We can do this, honey. We can do this. And, it, and, 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 and then it's, it's snowballing, and then it was a three-feet room, and then all of a sudden, listen, I have, my father lives on, we have a massive duplex, and the whole house is in upheaval because of a six-by-five square foot of bathroom. The whole house is in, I don't understand how that happens. It just grows and grows and grows, and you wonder what happened. I have a friend, Jeff, Jeff in Home Depot. I'm almost afraid to walk into Home Depot because, Jeff, I'm hoping I don't see Jeff, even though I know I need Jeff in the plumbing department. He would tell me what to buy and what not to buy and how to put them all together. So, personal, first name basis with our Home Depot plumber, Jeff. But God's construction project, unlike mine, planning, planning, timing, finances, energy, money, all the things that you don't have, you're doing. God is not hindered by all of the things that hindered me from completing the project that I set out to do. God is at work in you and in me, and he never gives up. He never gives up. So our passage that we're going to camp at today is in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse number 3. Second Peter chapter 1, starting at verse number tr uh, 3. We're going to look at um, the first two verses. But I want to break it down for you this way. The first two verses, we're going to talk about a fashioning of the heart. A fashioning of the heart. In order for God to change this world, he has to fashion, mold, create, change some things inside of me and you for that to happen. And he brings everything to the table. Unlike me, not having all the tools and all the know-hows, there's some things that is left off the table. God brings everything to the table. Verse number three says, His, that's God's, divine power that, that describes him has given us everything we need for life. His divine power has given us everything we need for life. I like what God brings to the table. He brings his power to change things. The word power there, some of you are familiar with it, it's that Greek word didymus, that where we get our word dynamite from. It's, 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 it's power, explosive power. Now, if I say to you, you know, there's going to be a nuclear bomb exploding in 15 minutes outside the door of these churches. Jump in, your, jump in your car and see how far you can reach before you are evaporated. What are the chances of that happening? You're making it out alive. That's power. God made that power. So when God says, my power, his divine power is available. Trust me, friend, brothers, sisters, it's available. Look at... Romans chapter 8, verse 11. It's one of my classic verses. I, I love this verse because I have to remind myself that, you know what, Sam? You don't have it. You can't do it. But this verse says, and if, Romans 8, 11, and if the spirit of him, God, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you. Where is that? Who is living in you? If if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also do what? Give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. We have the power. There was an old cartoon years ago that says, I've got the power! I don't remember what cartoon it was, but... Christian, you've got the power. You've got the power to live and to be what God wants us to be. So we have that. 
His divine power has given us everything we need for life. You see that word life? Now, sometimes you can quickly look at it and say, well, it's a spiritual life. God has given us everything we need for our spirit so we can live and act and be. But it's talking about your daily existence. Just the, the day-to-day routine of life. He says, I will give you power there. How much of you, how many of you can nod your head and say, I can use some of that power in my daily routine in my life. And sometimes you think it's small. But God is interested in the small areas of your life and my life if you let him. If you'd let him. But it's, Peter here is speaking about our daily existence. And then he tells us, he's given us everything we need for life and godliness through or by means of our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory, his own glory and goodness. I'm reading from the NIV in case of some of the words might be uh, for some people. But he says, he says, you get it through knowledge. You get that power through knowledge. Knowledge of whom? Knowledge of him who is called us by his own glory and goodness. Gl- knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. We get that knowledge. Now, because you have knowledge doesn't mean you have the power automatically. Because knowledge doesn't equal action, you know. You can be very educated, but, but still a dummy. So knowledge doesn't equal power. So the knowledge he's talking about here is by means, it's, it's my heart needs to be fashioned by God through this knowledge so that he can change my heart. So we need to see 2 Peter 3.18. What does it say there? But grow in the grace and what? Knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He wants us to grow in that grace. We have it. What we need to do is grow in it. Grow in it. He has called us by his own glory and goodness. Now, sometimes we, we think that we live for ourselves. And we need to understand that the reason why God allow us to live is so that we can reflect his glory. Now, those biblical words sometimes go over your head. It simply means God wants you to make him look good. How are we doing? Am I making God look good at work? Am I making God look good on the expressway when it's really a distress way? Am I making him look good in my home, in my speech, in my business? uh, 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 Am I making him look good? Among, with my kids, am I making him look good? Some of us don't make God look good. God wants to shine through us. Romans 8, 29 says, For those he foreknew, he predestined to conform to the image of his son that we might be the firstborn among. He wants us to look like Christ. He wants us to conform to the image of Christ. Paul W. Powell says it like this. God is more concerned about our character than our comfort. His goal is not to pamper us physically, but to perfect us spiritually. That's his goal. And he's hard at work, working in you and me, fashioning our hearts. My heart is fashioned as I allow God, as I allow God's precious promises to change me. Church, tell me something. Where do you find God's precious promises? In his word. That's where you find God's precious promises. And notice Peter being the writer here. He was a rugged fisherman, and he uses all through the book of of 1st and 2nd Peter precious promises, precious hope. A precious Lord and Savior. He uses these words precious because I wonder if it's precious to him. Is God's word precious to you? Are they precious to you? Do you seek them out and cherish them? You know, when you have something precious, you don't want to just take it and put it in a drawer and stick it in a cupboard somewhere. You want to bring it out and display it and say, this is precious to me. God wants us to dig into his precious word we know what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, that, that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, 
rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the man or the person or the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped. Thoroughly equipped. How many of you would say, Sam, I would like to be totally and thoroughly equipped? Mm hmm Well, some of you anyway. Two out of three ain't bad. Thoroughly equipped. All scripture, he says. My heart is fashioned because I have God's, listen, I have God's divine nature inside of me. Why do I say that? He, he says, he says in, in verse 4, so that through, through them you may participate, listen, participate in what? In the divine nature. You and I can allow God's nature to live inside of you and me. He has placed his DNA inside of you and me to cause us to be. I like that. I like that. Because DNA says everything. Because DNA says, speaks of the nature of a person. And the nature of a person says everything about where you be, what you do, what you eat, how you go. The nature of a pig is the slob. You know what I'm saying? If you change that nature of the pig into a cat's nature, that pig will look like a pig, but he won't want to slob. Why? Because his nature has changed. He has a new DNA. God says, I have placed my nature, my DNA in your heart. You have the DNA of God inside of you. First John tells us, now, this, this verse, you've got to see it. First John. First John chapter 3, 9. 3, 9. First John 3, 9 says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Listen, why? Because God seed, DNA, nature, where? Remains in them. We cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. You and I have been born of God. We don't, now we sin, but we don't habitually sin. If you read the whole passage, you see it speaks in about habitual sin. And he tells, that's what tells us. Why? Because we have the seed of God inside of us. That's why we can, and the second, the last part of that verse, he says, and we escape, in your version, it would be nice to understand that it's, it's saying that you have escaped. That's why we have, or escape, have escaped the corruption of this world. When last you look at the news? How did the world look to you? Looks like a mess, right? Looks like it's decaying. The Bible calls it corruption. He says, because of my DNA inside of you, that's the only way you could have escaped that. Because you would have swept right down the stream with everybody else if it was not for the DNA of God inside of our hearts. Fashion in my heart. Fashion in my heart. Secondly, God is, I'm on the construction by God. So we're going to talk about the function, the functioning of the heart, five through seven. The functioning of the heart. Now our hearts are constantly under construction by God. I said that right from the get-go. What does a healthy heart look like? What does a healthy heart look like? Now uh, there's a whole lot involved in heart surgery and, and, and to me it's just scary. A friend of mine had a heart transplant construction a friend of mine, Dan, and um, leading up to his surgery, you know, he would share with me what happened, and I made it part of my life to pray for him and talk to him. And, but he said he wasn't fearful. So, you know, I interviewed him a little bit in preparation for this, and I, I said, Dan, what did you have to do in preparation for this surgery? But he says, well, there's a whole lot of things I need to work out get online, he researched all the best doctors who has good reputation, who understands, who have done many surgeries of the same, and who, who has good reputation among his peers, and, and so on and so And he, he dealt into an interview different people and so on and so forth, and of course the correct donor and all that kind of a stuff that goes into it. It's a whole lot that goes into that, that part of it. God has everything that we need to work those changes out in our lives to change our heart. So let's look at Peter. 
lays out seven characteristics of a healthy heart. Seven characteristics. In verse 5, he says, for this very reason. Now, why would he say for this very reason? For the reason that God has already fashioned your heart. Something needs to happen. Now he's going to show you the functioning of the heart. For this very reason, he says, make every effort. Now, there's one four-letter word that a lot of, a lot of us hate. W-O-R-K. I hear the groaning already. It's not even Monday morning yet. I hear the groaning already. This implies, when he says make every effort, this implies that you need to work. You need to do your part. The Bible says to work out your own salvation, for it is God who works in you, but to will and to do. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. He works in, you work out. He works in, you work out. It's a partnership that works. It works. It's the process of him changing our lives. And it's not just working, but it's working with zeal and with haste. That's, this, this is what the passage is saying. Make every, make every effort to add to your faith. Notice the word add. Everybody say add. Add to your faith. Now, you can't add to salvation. That is complete. Jesus, when Jesus went to the cross and he says, it is finished, guess what? It was finished. There's nothing you can add or subtract, for that matter, from the salvation that God has given those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. But you can add, listen, you can add to the growth of your faith because he wants your faith to grow and to mature. Add to your faith. Now, that word faith is, is that personal trust in Jesus Christ that you can add to. But we can add to the growth of our daily faith walk. You can add to that. How many of you want to like to grow in faith? Your faith sometimes get a little, yeah, yeah, you know, you know how it gets. Gets a little, and he wants you to grow. Add to your faith. Notice the, the succession of, of how the verses are laid out. He says, add to your faith goodness. Goodness, or some version would say uh, virtue. That quality of life that makes us stand out in excellence. Add goodness. Now, any person can say, I'm a good person. You hear that a lot. Well, I'm not a bad person. You know, you try to tell them about Christ. Yeah, I'm a good person. All right. Even the worst criminal in jail says he's a good person. It was just one act that threw him in there. But the rest of it, he said he was good. Go figure. He said, I'm a good person. Well, that, this, this, this is goodness that comes out of the heart that is changed. Because the Bible speaks about Another kind of goodness that you can't bring before the Lord because not by works. We can't stand and boast before God because of what we did. We can't stand that. And the Bible speaks in the Old Testament that our, our, our own righteousness are as filthy rags. So your goodness before God might be an affront because you're trying to do it on your own, outside of God, apart from God. But it's that quality of excellence. I, I used to teach the youth group. I said to them, um, you need to be a person who excels in your class. Don't settle for mediocrity. Don't settle for, like, water. You go for the lowest spot to settle. I says, aim high because, because God has called you to excellence. You give everything that you have because God has called you to excellence, and he's built in you so that you can aim high. So that excellence is, is, has to do with fulfilling one's purpose in life. That moral goodness, rather, is, has to do with fulfilling our purpose in life. To, again, to bring glory to God, to make God look good. And notice, next word, he says, add to your faith goodness, and to goodness he says knowledge. Knowledge. Correct insight. Truth understood, not understand, but Truth that is understood and is applied. More that knowledge that the Bible speaks about here is knowing a practice of knowledge. It's in my action, like discernment. I put it into action. Knowing how to handle life successfully. That's the knowledge he's talking about. Knowing how to handle life successfully. Now, we've been going through the book of Proverbs last summer. And if, you, if, if, if you're still a dummy, you just missed it. 
You just missed it because we had a whole wisdom series going through the book of Proverbs. How to speak, how to live, relationships, finances, uh, um, um, decisions, who, who to hang with, who not to hang with. We went through all of those little pieces of how to be wise, how to be wise. And that's, that's played out in the book of Proverbs, how to handle life successfully. You know what the sad thing is? There's lots of Christians who would have been Christian for some time, and you see their lives muttering and fumbling and all over the place, yet Jesus is the answer. Yet Jesus comes to give direction. And you wonder, what happened? What happened? Are they not allowing God to fashion their heart? Are they not allowing God to fashion their heart so that they can become? Then the next word he speaks about is, he says, add to your Add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge into knowledge. He uses the word self-control. Now, self-control is an interesting word because it's, it's holding oneself in restraint. When you could have, you didn't. When you should have, you didn't. Why? It's because something. Now, Galatians 5, 23 says that one of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Self-control. Now, self-control sounds like it's a self-control in self, but it, it's more than that. It's the Spirit of God who's restraining you, holding you back. Hold me back, Jesus, before I kill him. Hold me back, Jesus. Hold me back, Lord, before I take him out. It's God's Spirit holding you from doing what you ought not to do. All right? So, and, and, and the Proverbs talk about our tongue and holding our tongue and how, and how sometimes you want to you wanna say it, and, mm, mm, and the Spirit is holding it. Mm. Mm, sometimes you think it's a spirit, but it's your teeth holding it after you find out. You know, just, he, it's, this, this is what self-control is. It's handling, handling pleasure, handling the pleasures of life. When I could indulge, I didn't. Handling the pleasures of life. Now, the next word he says is, he says to add, to self-control, add perseverance, add to perseverance, godliness. Now I want to look at the word perseverance. He said self-control, and then he says perseverance. Now the word perseverance is, means to, to, un, to remain under. To remain under. Now if, 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 you, if you, you, see, you see those beams in the middle of the ceiling? I'm in construction, so I know what's going on in there. You see these columns? There's a massive column that goes up and supporting some thick beams, steel beams that go in this way, and they hold the, the other beams to stop this place from being on your lap, or right, maybe on your head first. All right? That's what that is. Those, those are pillars to remain there. And those things are under heavy stress when it snows and there's heavy snow on top of the roof. They are under stress constantly. But these pillars are making sure that they, that they hold up, to remain under, being steadfast under pressure. Now, listen to this now. Perseverance is handling the pressures of life. What do we say self-control is? Handling the pleasures of life. But perseverance is handling the pressures of life. Now, the Bible tells us that you and I cannot produce, we cannot produce perseverance unless we are tried, unless we are tested. James tells us that. James 1, 2, and 2 to 4 tells us that. He tells us that we must go through these pressures of life in order for us to, to grow in our perseverance. Then he uses the word. Then he says, add. Add self-control. Add perseverance. Add to perseverance, add godliness. Godliness. To live, what is godliness? Godliness is, is loyalty to God. It's living reverently for God. And, and, and really, what the part that I like about this, the meaning of this word is having a God bent. There's something in me that's drawing me towards God. Have you ever put a plant near the sunlight of a window and it's dark on this side but it's sunny on that side and the plant is like... I wonder why the plant wants to do that. Because it knows that... He, the plant knows that what it needs is over there. You and I, what we need is God. So we need to have that God bent. The things that I want to do, I don't want to do it because I feel that God bent inside of me to be what God wants me to be. 
That's godliness. Being devoted to God. Living above, living, listen, living above the petty things in life. I'm living above it because I have that God benignness to seek God's will, God's welfare, and to look out for the welfare of others. Then the next word he uses is, is brotherly kindness. We're talking, about, we're talking about the functioning of the heart. The function of the heart. Brotherly kindness. He says brotherly, that word brotherly kindness, you, some of you know brotherly kindness, uh, brotherly has to do with the, the Greek word Philadelphia. That's where we get the you know, brotherly state. You know, uh, Philadelphia, that's, that's, that's where that word comes from. But it, it's, it's, it speaks of brotherly kindness. Kindness to one another. Now, it's not easy, humanly speaking, to get all types of nationalities and backgrounds together in one place. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. You see, in order for me to change the world, in order for this world to change, I need to understand that. My brotherly love and kindness to each other is very important for the world to see. The Bible tells us in John 13, 35, it says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you what? If you love one another. The world needs to see that. We, they of all background, nationalities, race. Not race. There's only one race, the human race. All right? All nationalities and background, he says, he says, we can be example. That's number one. Number two, our love for each other shows, is evident that our hearts are changed. Evidence that our hearts are changed. First John tells us what happens in our hearts when we change. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. That's what he says. That's what he says. So, brotherly kindness. And then he says, after he says, at your faith, goodness, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control to perseverance, perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, he says, love. That love. Well, yeah, yeah, but there is not much difference, Sam. Well, yeah, there is a difference. You see, the Greek has a couple, Greek has a few different words for love. And if you, if you study that, you, you understand the different words of all. Right here, it's talking about that self-sacrificial love that God, that Jesus Christ demonstrated on the cross for you and me. I love the verse in Romans that says, that says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You mean while I was hating God, lusting, committing adultery, fornication, God still loved me and he still would have gone to the cross? You know what kind of love is that? That's an unconditional love. That's agape love. That's the kind of love he wants us to demonstrate. He wants us to demonstrate. When we show brotherly love, we love because our likenesses. But when we show agape love, we love in spite of our differences. In spite of our differences, we love because of the agape love of, of God inside of our hearts. And then thirdly, the fruit, the fruits of our hearts. In order for me to change, we need, I need to know the fruits of my heart. What's going on? What's going on inside of you? Or the lack of it, for that matter. Because not every Christian is fruitful as we'll see. Verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 says, If you possess these qualities in increasing sorry, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Ineffective and unproductive. But the first part of it is, it says, for if you possess these qualities, if you grow, mature, abound, is the word, increase in increasing measure in these qualities, he says, he talks about having that quality in excess. You see, every Christian has fruit. It's just a matter of what size fruit you're wearing. You see, you can have a tiny fruit like this. It's a fruit. God did his part. God did his part. He put the seed inside of you. There's fruit there. But he wants us to grow 
mature in that fruit. Mature in that fruit. And it says it keeps us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of him. It keeps us from being fruitless. A Christian shouldn't be indistinguishable from non-Christian. You ought to see, a fruitless Christian is a useless Christian. Why do I say that? Because God is in the business of showing you off. And every time God says, here's my brother, here's my sister, let me show them off. And he looks around. You see leaves, but no fruit. He can't show you off then. You remember the book of Job? Remember Job? God and Job, God and Satan were speaking, and, and, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? Hmm? How he is faithful, upright. Have you considered him? God was ready to show Job off. Can God do that with me and you? God help us. God, God help us. He wanted, he was showing Job off. God wants to show us off because when, when, we, when, when God shows us off, we bring glory to him and we make him look good. There we go again. Our purpose and our existence is to bring glory to God. To bring glory to God. But what happens? What happens? What happens in, that, in, in, in those areas when we lack fruit? We lack fruit and it doesn't, it doesn't show it, does, it shows that we are nearsighted. We only think about our own. We don't think about others. We don't think about, we don't care about evangelism anymore. We don't care about sharing our faith anymore. We're nearsighted. The Bible calls it even blind. You only care about the things that you can see up close. The things I can see up close in our knowledge. And the Bible says we need to, we need to shake that. We need to shake that. We need to show in increasing measure, the fruit of our hearts. And finally, 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 and lastly, the finality of our hearts. Listen, this world is not going to last forever. It's not going to last forever, thank God. It's not going to last forever. The day is coming when the fashioning of our hearts will be completed. The Bible says in Corinthians, now we see dim through a glass, dim, dark, but then face to face. I'll be known as I am known because of Jesus Christ. He will instantly change me to be who I ought to be. That day is coming. That day is coming. So in the finality of our hearts, what does he say? Verse, verse 10. It says, therefore, my brothers, be all eager to make your calling and election sure. What is he saying there? He's saying, Christian, or if you think you are, examine yourself. There's some things in life you must be sure, sure, 100% sure of. And if you're not sure of your salvation, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourself and see whether or not you're in the faith. Examine yourself. Am I just a churchgoer? Do I like, you know, I like to be around nice people. So I hang with the Christians. Makes me feel good. You know, they say good things to me. You know? <laughs> it's scary because... If the rapture takes place, not everybody's going up. Some will be left behind. And that's sad. So if you're not sure, today's the day to be sure. Examine yourself. Search your heart. Search your heart and see whether or not you're in the faith. Paul says, and this is the statement I think all of us would like to make, I fought a good fight. And now laid up for me a crown of life that God will give to me, and not just me, but all those who put their trust in him. Listen, listen to how he ends in verse 11. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So God is at work inside of you, 
fashion in your heart. He brings all the power to the table to get that done. He shows us the functioning of our hearts, how it comes together. He shows us the fruit and what it needs to be or the lack of it and how that fruit can grow in our hearts. And finally, finally, he shows us the finality of our hearts where one day we'll be free. We'll be free. We'll be free. Bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to ask uh, a pastor school to just come at this moment and close our time. that you've given us your servant to share this word for us. But Lord God, I just pray that we would allow you to search our hearts and not only find us pleasing and acceptable in your eyes, but Lord God, that you would find us under construction, seeking to grow, and seeking to show who you are in us every day of our lives, in every aspect of our lives. Lord, we live in a fallen world. And we can call ourselves fellow strugglers in that world, but you want us to rise above. That we might be able to proclaim, rightly proclaim, who you are to this world. Lord Jesus, use the word as Brother Sam brought to us today. Use this message to motivate, to lead, and to direct where you want us to be and where you want us to go. Oh, Lord, it's not by mistake that you brought each of us here today. It's not by mistake that, that you've allowed us to be where we are. And it's not by mistake that you send us forth. I pray, Lord God, that each of us could go forth and be able to say to what has been brought to us today, amen and amen, let it be so, and let us grow. In your holy, mighty, sovereign name, Lord Jesus Christ, we humbly pray. God's people did say, Amen.